Good afternoon and welcome to the 23rd annual exhibit of hydrogen and fuel cell technologies. We've been discussing all sorts of potential applications, all sorts of, way of ways of using renewable energy, and it's a complex a group of phenomena that we're talking about. Uh, we're always looking for the best way to use energy carriers such as hydrogen, and of course one option is methanol. Um, Next up on the stage, we'll be talking to someone who has a methanol vision. Um, uh, some people have 2020 vision, he has a 2020 methanol vision, and it's all to do with liquid electricity, that's the term he uses. It's Mats Fries Jensen, who's CCO of Sir Energy in Denmark. Please welcome with me, Mats Jensen. Hi. Good afternoon. Thank you. So, among other things, you guys are specialists in converting methanol to electricity. Um, we always want to know when we talk about energy carriers, um, where do you get the energy from? Uh, because that's the difference between green energy and uh, conventional hydrocarbons. So where do you get the energy from before you go to methanol? Well, we get it from a range of sources, and that's the strength about methanol. You don't just get it from one place, you get it from many other places. Mm -hmm. the, the components of methanol is hydrogen and CO2, mm -hmm. and that can be bound in biomass or as liquid electricity, some mm -hmm. from hydrogen and then bound to carbon, and then you have methanol. Mm -hmm. And of course, every time people hear biomass, we all know that's a renewable re resource. It's also wasted. So uh, this is wonderful when we hear that we're using resources that are currently not used. Uh, it's CO2 neutral. As soon as people hear um, you're a adding CO2 into the question, <laughs> because uh, I believe your initial resource, if you use other renewable resources, for instance, electrical energy generated by renewable wind turbines or solar, uh, you use that energy and then the process is what? You convert to hydrogen and then you... Exactly, and you can say it's basically the same. One process, you have no CO2, and then you go to no CO2. Here, we take CO2 away, use it as a carrier, and then we emit it again. So we use carbon as a resource to bind hydrogen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and another important point is we can take biomass and we can upgrade it with hydrogen. So we suddenly can get much more energy out of the biomass we do have. Mm -hmm. So these are really uh, ways of treating fuels to get it to the optimal for you, which is uh, methanol, the energy carrier. It could be the source of uh, wind turbines, it could be uh, um, solar, uh, it could be biomass. You're indifferent to the source, but the CO2 neutrality is a fundamental principle. Absolutely. And of course, when you say you're using CO2, I love this category of um, uh, uh, decarbonization, because uh, uh, it's an opportunity to use existing carbon uh, emissions that are non-avoidable, for instance, in the industry. Um, they're there anyway, and so you don't change the CO2 emissions by using them. What does that involve? Well, um, for example, the uh, cement production that we, we do, we emit CO2 from the production process. Mm -hmm. So if we want cement in the future, we would still have CO2 emissions from there. This emission we can then capture put it into a liquid fuel, we can use to fuel our cars. So that's actually where we recycle the hydrogen mm -hmm. and the carbon. Mm -hmm. Okay, now there's of course a debate here, and I know um, there's many ways to, to cut this cake, <laughs> but uh, if you have uh, renewable sources such as wind energy, it's classic electrolysis, and then you have hydrogen, some people would say, well, why not stick with the hydrogen? Why move from hydrogen to methanol? Um, is there energy loss involved? What is the payoff of going to methanol? Um, how do you take that question? Well, it's very simple. It's uh, liquid electricity in a cup. Well, if this was methanol, you shouldn't drink it. But the whole point is, it's very easy to store, it's easy to distribute, and you can store it and just transport it around the world. So it's just making hydrogen into something that's feasible to store, distribute, and carry around the world. Mm -hmm. So, I see you're enjoying the water. Um, <laughs> this has a, a huge influence upon potential applications. Some people feel satisfied with hydrogen, but where is the cutting edge advantage for methanol? It's both the same source, it's carbon neutral, but the choice for methanol allows for different applications um, and different distribution uh, capacities. So what are the advantages here? 
Well, it's primarily places where you need a lot of energy density. Mm -hmm. So, for example, vehicles that should drive maybe 100 kilometers, batteries is a perfect technology. Mm -hmm. As soon as you want 800 kilometers of range on your car, suddenly storage of energy and energy density becomes a, an important question. So that's where methanol comes into play. When you want to store large amounts of energy, you don't have a lot of room to do it, and uh, you want to do it in a simple and cheap way. Okay. There are specific applications that we can sort of go through. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, of course, we do have a slide here for the methanol. We have to address this at some point. We shouldn't forget it. <laughs> no. uh, do we do this now or do we go to the applications? Y your choice. Your choice. I think we should start with the vision, um, uh, which is illustrated here, uh, the methanol vision. Exactly. So, Serenity is a part of the methanol vision and uh, many others uh, are taking part of this. And um, our focus is to make sure that the entire loop of methanol is closed and it's to ensure that when we want to use methanol, being in a vehicle, being on a ship, we can do it in a highly effective way with no particulate emissions. So that's, you could say, Serenity's place in the methanol vision. Mm -hmm. Now, storing a liquid, transporting a liquid, we have an entire industry already doing that. Eventually, when we are not using fossil fuels anymore, these people need something to do. And in the future, we see them storing liquid electricity in form of methanol. And of course, this involves optimizing uh, the ways we use methanol as an energy carrier for electricity. You're not, I mean, you could burn methanol, mm -hmm. but um, uh, why would you want to? Isn't it more effective to use it with a reformer or with a fuel cell? That's what you're working towards, isn't it? Exactly. So Serenity manufactures a methanol fuel cell technology based on reformed methanol fuel cells. And uh, we can achieve very high efficiencies because of the combination of a high temperature PEM fuel cell with a methanol reformer. Mm -hmm. Now, by doing this, we suddenly open up for many applications that in the past has been explored, but was discarded because of low efficiencies and a complex system. So that, you could say, technology leap is something we have changed. Mm -hmm. This is fascinating. During the preparation, we talked about this. Um, we've had methanol-powered um, uh, fuel cells come and go and come and go, um, and uh, particularly the small applications, the methanol storage for your computer. Um, uh, batteries have improved slightly, so it seems to be uh, not so marketable a, 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 a proposition. Um, uh, but you're um, moving back into the methanol field here, and there must be huge motivation to do this. Mm. Is it? Um, consumer potential? Um, is it simply you've got a higher efficiency? You mentioned the simplicity. Um, so what is the step that has made you go in that direction? Well, we actually never left. Okay. <laughs> we, um, we say we have always uh, developed technology in this direction. Mm -hmm. The only point is now we're at the stage where we can implement it in vehicles. We can demonstrate vehicles on the street driving on methanol. We have ships on methanol and we can start to demonstrate this vision in full life. Mm -hmm. When we look at the applications, there's almost as if there's a history also in the fuel cell industry. Um, uh, fuel cells are, uh, or they were initially very expensive, so the, the, the niche markets that we covered were things like forklift trucks, um, uh, auxiliary power that has to be 100% reliable, um, uh, and uh, those were the only viable commercial models. And, it's progressively widened. Do you also cover those niche markets as a starting factor? For instance, um, uh, auxiliary power, backup power. Uh, do you look at those markets as well? Yes, we're already in the market with the methanol fuel cells for, for backup power, or actually more supplemental power in markets that today have small diesel generators. So Serenity's vision is to wipe diesel generators off the face of the earth. We start with small stationary gensets, Eventually, we'll do the same on ships and in cars. Mm -hmm. So, uh, stationary applications, auxiliary power, anything I'm missing here? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, you could say on, on ships, we have for a long time been working on replacing both the main fuel, which is the bunker oil, mm -hmm. um, to a, a more uh, renewable alternative of methanol. Mm -hmm. So today, we have demonstrations on ships. Um, and eventually we'll go to mobility, where we today at a booth uh, demonstrate a, an 800 kilometer range electric mo vehicle mm -hmm. that has five minutes of refueling time. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where we bridge the gap between um, known technologies. 
And of course, the logistics of fueling are relatively simple. You've brought with you this wonderful uh, defensive apparatus here, um, uh, which is a nozzle. Yeah, exactly. And um, this uh, does look a little uh, special. What's more special about it is what goes inside it, because it's just a liquid. So this means that the infrastructure we have today on every street corner can be reused with another liquid, which means we don't have to invest in any new infrastructure. We just reuse the one we already have. This we already demonstrated in Denmark, where we have the first methanol refueling station in Europe. Um, if you go to China, there's already a huge methanol infrastructure ongoing uh, for mobility there. Mm -hmm. Some six, seven percent of all transportation fuels in China is methanol. So it is Europe that you could say is dragging a little bit there. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned the evil diesel. <laughs> when we uh, talk about uh, urban populations um, and the effect of um, uh, traffic density, yeah. uh, one of the big issues, of course, is not simply the gasoline motor, but uh, it is what the Germans called Feinstaub, the fine particle emissions of diesel cars. Um, and uh, this is particularly, uh, it's not simply cars, of course, the delivery vehicles, the garbage trucks and so on, they're largely diesel. Mm. Um, uh, when you say, wipe the diesel off the face of the earth, can you help us to get rid of this uh, carcinogenic uh, environmental issue um, in large urban centers? Uh, this, is, this is the whole point. Um, our technology has zero harmful emissions. So this means that there's no particulate matter, there's no NOx, there's, there's no dangerous things for people. We do emit CO2, but that's why it's important to close the CO2 loop by using renewable energy to produce the methanol. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, we can basically clean up the cities. Mm -hmm. I think this is an important issue. Somehow I want to labor this point because uh, people talk about hydrocarbons, the conventional ones, of course, there's all sorts of other things in them, sulfurs and whatever, and then there's this fine particle stuff. Uh, you're making a hydrocarbon out of hydrogen, um, but it's important to stress um, CO2 emissions don't give you lung cancer, do they? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, CO2 is, of course, a major problem for us now, but it's only because we're digging it out of the earth and emitting it at a completely crazy rate. Mm -hmm. So CO2 in our atmosphere is, is already there, and it will continue to be there. Mm -hmm. uh, we just have to do it in a little bit smarter way mm -hmm. by recycling the CO2 we emit. Mm -hmm. And this is, of course, uh, when you, uh, it's a question of scale here, of course, but um, Germany, for instance, is entirely dependent upon imported fossil fuels. Um, so we're discussing an issue that is not simply the electric grid, um, it's potentially moving into the standard fossil fuel market um, and taking a chunk out of that, which is a huge part of our energy budget. Uh, when you say closing the loop, I find this important uh, because what you're talking about is comparing using a thousand years of carbon emissions stored in the form of hydrocarbons in the earth per day or using what already exists in the environment uh, to reach a CO2 neutral perspective or even decarbonizing the industry. That's the goal, isn't it? Um, that's correct. Mm -hmm. I mean, our plan is basically to uh, reuse a concept well known and then optimize the way we convert methanol into electricity. Mm -hmm. It can be done today, that's it's not a big problem. You can put it in a combustion engine and drive your car around. Mm -hmm. But we see it even further. We see it as uh, electrifying the transportation and optimizing the energy efficiency on conversion. Mm -hmm. So it's not just about creating electricity for a vehicle, it's also using the waste heat from the fuel cell to heat up the vehicle and even use it for uh, air conditioning. So uh, this increases, of course, the efficiency of the whole system. If there are questions from the audience, you can just raise your hand. We have time for uh, just one or two. It's such a complicated issue, of course, and knowing where to dive in um, is uh, difficult. Um, we need to talk about the future, of course. Um, uh, uh, the future is today <laughs> when we talk about the environment. Um, and it's also a question of commercial viability of these things right now. Unfortunately, we're not getting enough uh, support um, uh, globally to help us. Um, but what is the commercial viability right now? Are these, uh, when I say commercially viable, is this um, a, a product, your vehicle right now, that can com commercially compete with existing delivery vehicles, for example? 
So the vehicle itself is today more expensive than a combustion engine vehicle. Mm -hmm. So that's clear. We need to work there. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the fuel side, if you take the cost of methanol today with taxes and compare that to the fuel economy of diesel, we can save 30% today. So it's not about one day we'll become competitive on the fuel economics. We are that today. Mm -hmm. So we have some work to do on the, on the technology itself. Mm -hmm. But on the fuel economics and the fuel energy, we're already there. And besides, of course, the, the environmental um, effect of using this technology, there's a number of other things that I think that are interesting spin-offs, uh, one of them being simply uh, noise pollution. Uh, is it possible to st stand beside your truck and start it up and hear how quiet it is? What would you hear? Well, I signed a piece of paper saying I wouldn't do it, so, uh, so I can't do it. But in reality, you cannot hear it. It will just be a, a low, very low hum, and you will see the state of charge on your battery electric vehicle increase. Mm -hmm. That's how it is. This is a fascinating factor because they have the garbage trucks, of course. Uh, wherever there's traffic in Berlin, uh, you pay less rent because you're close to the streets. Um, were the vehicles changed, uh, those homeowners would get a lot more returns on their rented uh, um, real estate. It is a broad issue. Um, how close are we to um, uh, mass production of such vehicles? Uh, we still have, uh, have a ways to go. Um, but uh, I would say we are, we are closing the, that gap pretty fast. Um, we see many interesting initiatives. Here in Europe, we are a little bit conservative, but in, in, in new markets like China, uh, things are speeding up much faster. Mm -hmm. So yeah. look to the east. Uh, go to the east, yes. Uh, look to the east. Yeah, look to the east. Um, Ex oriente lux is the famous Latin quotation. Okay. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Um, I think this is an important vision. I think we need to recall this and see where we are a few years from now. Um, there's always a model for methanol. Um, it doesn't need to replace hydrogen. It's an added benefit, but it could be the game changer. Mm. So I agree. <laughs> we'll find out soon, won't yep. we? Yep. Um, I've been talking to Mats Fries Jensen, who's CCO at uh, Sur Energy in Denmark. It's been a pleasure talking to you about the methanol vision. I hope you'll come back and see us next year and tell us how things are going. Yeah. Will do. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Go visit their booth also and see their car, which is B40 over there, and uh, the nozzle um, and how that works. Um, it's a fascinating unit. Thank you very much. Up, ne up next on stage, we'll be talking to Greg Walsh. Uh, from Greenlight Innovation and Thomas Dana, who is from uh, AVL List, and they'll be talking about a deep look at state of the art high centrist system testbed. Uh, stay tuned, the drinks are on the house, we'll be back in a minute.